Welcome to your deep dive. So it seems you're looking to really get a grip on China, yeah. their history, their culture, where things stand today. It's a big one. It is a big one. And we've got um, yeah, we've got a real treat for you. We're diving into some fascinating historical accounts. Yes. Spiced up with Bertrand Russell's analysis. Yeah. You know, I always loved Bertrand Russell's take on China because he really gets to the heart of what makes China tick. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not caught up in the day to day political kind of back and forth. Right. He wants to understand the essence of the civilization. It's almost like he's giving us the cheat codes to like yes. understanding China's soul. <laughs> Absolutely. Um. So where do we even begin with a history as massive as China's? Well, you got to start at the beginning, right? Ancient China. OK. And, and I'm talking ancient China. Okay. I mean, this is, uh, forget what you think you know about, like, ancient civilizations. Right. These guys were light years ahead. Mm. We're talking sophisticated systems of governance, mm-hmm. philosophy, technology, all happening thousands of years ago. Okay, so paint me a picture here. Yeah. What made ancient China tick? At their core, they were pragmatists. Oh, okay. Okay, so they were practical, mm-hmm. down-to-earth, this world focused. Okay. Let me give you an example. Yeah. The Yellow River. Okay prone to devastating sluts. Right? right. So what do they do? Yeah. They don't offer sacrifices to appease some river god. Right. They're like, no, we're going to figure this out. Mm-hmm. Emperors like Yao, Shun, and Yu tackled the problem with engineering and innovation. Wow. So practical. Exactly. With a very different approach to nature. A different approach to nature. It was all about what works. Mm-hmm. And this wasn't just a fluke. Okay. This practical, this world focus, Mm -hmm. you see it echoing throughout Chinese history. Interesting. Even their legendary emperors were held to incredibly high standards. Okay. So like Yao. Yeah. He wasn't just powerful. Mm -hmm. He was admired for being reverential, intelligent, accomplished, and thoughtful. Wow. They weren't big on divine. right? Right. It was about merit and serving the people. So we see this emphasis on intellect and virtue very early on. Absolutely. But I'm guessing it wasn't all smooth sailing. Of course not. History tends to have a few plot twists. Oh, Oh, yeah. History loves a good plot twist. Right. Uh, You want to talk about a plot twist? Yeah. How about the first emperor, Qin Shi Huang? Okay. You know, the Great Wall guy? Right. Yeah. Okay. So he unified China in the third century BC. Okay. But he was also a radical. This is where things get interesting. Oh, yeah. We're talking about the burning of books and burying of scholars, right? Yeah. Trying to erase history. That's intense. It was intense. Yeah. Brutal. Shocking. Yeah. But it highlights this um, <laughs> this deep-seated need for stability in China. Okay. Xi Huang saw those scholars clinging to old ways of thinking mm-hmm. as a threat to his vision right. of a unified, standardized China. So he went with the clean slate approach. Yeah, you could say that. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just about suppressing dissent. Okay. He established a whole new governing philosophy. Yes. Legalism. Well, legalism. Basically, it emphasized strict laws and punishments to maintain order. Okay. Think of it like the ultimate tough love approach to nation building. Wow. Progress with a very firm hand. Yes. So how did this play out in the long run? Well, this pattern you see. Yeah. Strong centralized rule punctuated by periods of upheaval and change, Mm. it becomes a recurring theme in Chinese history. Interesting. It's like they thrive on stability, Mm -hmm. but they need those moments of creative destruction to keep things moving. So fascinating. Isn't it fascinating? And speaking of fascinating, we can't talk about ancient China without talking about Confucianism. Mm -hmm. It's almost synonymous with Chinese culture, right? It is, but it's often misunderstood. Okay, how so? Well, Confucianism isn't a religion. Okay. Not in the traditional sense anyway. Right. It's more like an ethical framework, a way of living, a way to be in harmony with yourself, your family, society as a whole. Okay. It's about understanding your place in the grand scheme of things Mm -hmm. and fulfilling your role with virtue. So less about worshiping a deity and more about just like being a good person yeah. and contributing to the good of all. Exactly. Okay, that makes sense. And this is where we see a stark contrast with Western thought. Okay. Especially as it developed during the Enlightenment. Okay. While the West became obsessed with progress, mm-hmm. often driven by a desire for power, but disguised as something noble. Right. Confucianism emphasized contentment, moral cultivation, 
finding beauty in the enduring order of things. So it's like those two paths are constantly diverging. Yes. The West always striving for something more, something new, mm -hmm. and China finding wisdom in tradition and balance. That tension, that's a tension that continues to this very day. Wow. But to really grasp the weight of that tension, we need to understand just how powerful China was for centuries. Okay, let's talk about China's dominance then. I mean, we all know about the Great Wall and the Silk Road, but set the stage for us. Yeah. Just how influential were they? Imagine a world where China is the undisputed superpower. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, they were the economic engine, the cultural trendsetter, mm -hmm. the military powerhouse. Yeah. For them, the rest of the world was, well, yeah. mostly irrelevant. It sounds like they had a pretty good run. They did. But nothing lasts forever. You got it. And that leads us to a pivotal moment in history. Okay. The 19th century. Mm. Remember that stark contrast between Western and Eastern thought we talked about? Yes. Well, buckle up because things are about to get really interesting. And by interesting, I mean messy. Uh-oh. Yeah. Okay. So we've got China at the height of their power. Mm. This ancient civilization with a worldview like completely different from what's developing in the West. Yeah. Totally different universe. So what happens when these two worlds collide? Well... It's not pretty. Oh. I imagine like you're on top of the world, right? Yeah. For centuries, and then suddenly these like brash newcomers show up. Right. Demanding you play by their rules. Yeah. That's essentially what China faced in the 19th century. Okay. The Western power is fueled by industrialization mm -hmm. and a sense of, let's be honest, yeah. superiority mm -hmm. came knocking. Yeah. With cannons blazing. And I'm guessing those knocks weren't very polite. No, not at all. We are talking about the Opium Wars. Right. Britain was desperate to break into the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? Yeah. They flood the country with opium. Wow. Creating widespread addiction. It's awful. Social chaos. Yeah. It was a calculated move to weaken China from within. So they're adding insult to injury. Yeah. What happened when China tried to fight back against this? They were met with overwhelming force. Okay. The British military crushed them in the First Opium War okay, and forced China to sign a series of unequal treaties. Unequal treaties. Yeah, these treaties forced China to open up more ports to trade, cede Hong Kong to the British. Right. And essentially hand over control of their own economic destiny. So much for being the Middle Kingdom, right? I know, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. you can come in, uh -huh. but it's our way or the highway. Yeah, on someone else's terms completely. Well, exactly. And it wasn't just Britain. Right. Other Western powers sensing an opportunity. Of course. They piled on. Right. With their own demands, their own unequal treaties. Like they smelled blood in the water. Yeah. France, Germany, Russia, Japan. Everyone wanted a piece of the pie. It's almost hard to fathom the humiliation that China must have felt during this period. Yeah. They were just being carved up like a Thanksgiving turkey. It was a devastating period. Yeah. Both materially and psychologically. Yeah. Imagine the treasures that were lost mm -hmm. when the British and French looted and burned the Summer Palace in Beijing. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. I mean, we're talking about the destruction of a cultural treasure. Right. I mean, this would be like destroying the Louvre or the Hermitage, a deliberate act of cultural vandalism. It's amazing how these events, centuries later, still have the power to evoke such strong emotions. Oh, absolutely. You can really see why this period continues to cast a shadow over China's relationship with the West. 100%. This is where that deep mistrust of Western intentions comes from. Yeah. And this determination mm -hmm. to never be caught in such a vulnerable position again. Wow. But speaking of vulnerable positions, let's talk about Japan for a second. Okay. Remember how we talked about contrasting worldviews? Yes. Okay. Well, Japan had its own encounter with the West. Right. But their response was completely different. Japan. This is where things get really interesting yeah. because they don't resist modernization. They embrace it. They went full throttle. It's incredible. It's like they said, if you can't beat them, join them. Right. And then try to beat them at their own game. Right. The Meiji Restoration in 1868, it was a pivotal moment. Okay. I mean, it was like flipping a switch. They went from a feudal society to a modern industrialized nation in just a few decades. That's incredible. They studied Western technology, mm -hmm. adopted Western military tactics. Wow. I mean, they even started dressing like Westerners. It sounds like they were determined to outwest the West. In a way, they were. Yeah. But it wasn't just about mimicking. Right. It was about 
adapting, innovating. They took what they learned and made it their own. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And they did it with this incredible speed and efficiency. That's remarkable. Within a generation. Yeah. They went from being the ones being pushed around. Right to being a force to be reckoned with. Talk about a complete 180. I know, it's amazing. But all of this modernization must have come at a cost. Of course. I mean, it's hard to imagine that such rapid change wouldn't create some internal friction. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Rapid modernization created all sorts of social and political upheavals. Like what? You name it, rebellions, assassinations, yeah. a lot of uncertainty about what it meant to be Japanese in this new world. Right, it's like an identity crisis almost. Totally. Yeah. But the Meiji government was savvy. Okay. They managed to consolidate power in a really interesting way How? by elevating the emperor to a symbol of national unity. Ah, the emperor. Right. I remember that anecdote about how the Jesuits initially thought that the Mikado was like the Pope. Oh yeah, they totally overestimated his actual power. Right. At that time, it was the shogun who held the reins. Right. But after the Meiji Restoration, the emperor, though still a figurehead, mm -hmm. became this potent symbol. So they used this reverence for the emperor to rally the nation around this like, yes. ambitious modernization project. Exactly. It's fascinating how they managed to harness tradition to fuel their transformation. Brilliant strategy. Yeah. And it worked. By the end of the 19th century, yeah. Japan was a major power okay. with a modern military mm -hmm. and a newfound confidence. So they're ready to test out their strength on the world stage? They were ready. And unfortunately for China, they became the target. Yeah. This is where we get to the first Sino-Japanese War, right? That's right. It's almost like history repeating itself. It is. But with a new player in the role of the aggressor. Exactly. Mm -hmm. China, once the dominant force in East Asia, Right. found itself facing a modernized, right. militarized Japan. And, you know, China wasn't ready for them. Yeah. It was a swift and decisive victory for the Japanese. Oh. A crushing defeat for China. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah. it really exposed the weaknesses of their military. Right. And just shattered any illusions they might have had about their place in the world. Talk about a wake-up call. Yeah, big time. So we've got... China reeling from this defeat, mm. Japan flexing its newfound muscles, yeah. and the Western power is still circling like sharks. Oh, they're always lurking. What a powder keg. Yeah, it was a recipe for disaster. So what happens? I mean... You've got the Boxer Rebellion. Right. You've got the Russo-Japanese War. China basically becomes a pawn in these larger power struggles. It's like everyone was playing their own game of risk okay. using China as the board. Exactly. But eventually someone has to call for a ceasefire, right? Well, sort of. Yep. This brings us to the Washington Conference in 1921. Okay. So all the major powers come together mm -hmm. and they're ostensibly there to discuss peace and disarmament in the Pacific. Right. But let's be real. Yeah. It was about managing their own interests. Right. With China stuck in the middle. So more of the same, just with yeah. fancier suits and better table manners. You said it. Yeah. But this is where Bertrand Russell's analysis gets really interesting. Okay. He saw right through the facade. What do you mean? He was deeply skeptical of the West's motives in China, mm -hmm. especially when it came to this consortium of banks okay. that were eager to lend money to the struggling nation. You mean those loans weren't entirely altruistic? Russell certainly didn't think so. Yeah. He saw it as a way for foreign powers to gain even more leverage over China. Wow. He even warned about these Huquang bonds. The what? Huquang bonds. Okay. Suggesting they were basically a recipe for economic control. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Nope. Especially in international relations. Not especially in international relations. But, I mean, what alternative did China have? Right. They were in desperate need of financial help. That's the tragic irony. Yeah. By accepting these loans, yeah. they risked falling deeper into debt. Yeah. Becoming even more dependent on the very powers that exploited them in the first place. That's like damned if you do, damned if you don't. Exactly. So what was Russell's ultimate prediction for China? Yeah. Was there any hope for them to break free from this cycle of exploitation? Mm -hmm. Find their own path to modernity? Well, Russell saw a future where China, pushed too far, yeah. would eventually rise up. Okay. He really believed that their deep sense of cultural identity, mm. combined with the resentment brewed over decades of humiliation, would inevitably lead to a rebellion against foreign influence. Wow. 
It's almost a chilling prediction, given what we know about China's trajectory in the 20th century. Yeah, it's it's not about predicting the future. Right. It's about understanding the forces at play. Right. The potential consequences of actions. Yeah, and that's what makes Russell's analysis so relevant even today. Absolutely. He challenges us to see beyond the headlines. Yes. To grasp those deep historical currents that are always shaping the world around us. It's about asking those tough questions. Yeah. You know, challenging assumptions, mm -hmm. looking for those deeper motivations. It's about realizing there's always another side to the story. Always. Right. And in this case, understanding China's perspective, mm -hmm. their values, their historical experience. It's essential for navigating the complexities of the world we live in. It's about bridging that gap between East and West. Yeah. Recognizing that there are different ways of seeing the world, mm -hmm. different paths to progress, different definitions of success. Absolutely. And who knows, maybe by understanding China's journey. Yeah. We might even learn a thing or two about ourselves. Talk about food for thought. Well, this has been an incredible journey through history. It has. Thank you for sharing your insights with us. My pleasure. And listeners, we hope this deep dive has left you with a newfound appreciation for the complexities of China's story. Yeah. It's a story that's still being written. Very true. And as we've learned, understanding the past yeah. is often the key to navigating the present and shaping the future. Couldn't agree more. It's been a pleasure exploring with you. Like.